Is it time to stop selling arms to Israel? Most people back to ban even before three British aid workers were killed. Will their deaths and the diplomatic fallout force the government's hand? Tonight, families and colleagues pay tribute to those aid workers killed, describing them as heroes. He's fought in these wars and come home with not a scratch, and he goes out to do something, you know, helpful. Yeah. And that's what happened. After a night of protests in Israel, a member of the war cabinet turns on the prime minister and echoes calls for early elections. So could Benjamin Netanyahu be running out of road? Also on the programme, a deadly earthquake rocks Taiwan. More than 130 people are still trapped after the 7.4 magnitude quake. We'll also have an exclusive report on how the UK has no national plan for the defence of the country in a war, despite renewed global threats. The main suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann complains he can't get a fair trial on separate rape charges because of worldwide prejudice. And will AI prove the music industry's friend or foe? Artists are worried. We'll take a look. That's all coming up on The World with me, Adam Parsons. A very good evening. Well, yesterday, confronted by the deaths of aid workers, the Israeli government opted for a policy of contrition, saying sorry, promising an investigation, hoping the anger would die down. Well, it hasn't. Today, the victims of the attack, all linked to the charity World Central Kitchen, are in body bags. Their vehicles were deliberately targeted, a process that we'll be piecing together for you later. And the cacophony of criticism continues. A poll out today shows that even before this deadly attack, the British public was already in favour of a ban on arms sales to Israel. An even bigger majority believes Israel is violating human rights in Gaza, and it's a little hard to believe anyone's softened their opinion over the past 48 hours. And that sense of discontent isn't limited to Britain. America said it was outraged by the attack. We're going to be gauging reaction from Washington. And in Israel, where Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu re recovers from surgery, he's under political attack. Benny Gantz, an influential member of the war cabinet there, has called for new elections. Likud, the ruling party, has in turn accused Gantz of petty politics and risking paralysis and division. Now, the consequences of that attack are now turmoil. We'll be exploring that over the coming hour, including the question of arms sales. But first, tributes to those aid workers killed from their families. Here's our home editor, Jason Farrell. They each fought for their country, but died in a war that was not theirs. The three British military veterans who'd been providing security for aid workers are now en route to the UK. Their families say they return as heroes. James Kirby, a former army sniper, remembered today by his cousins. It's just devastating, devastating that he's fought in these wars and come home with not a scratch, and he goes out to do something, you know, helpful. Yeah. And that's what happened. He knew he had to go. His friends were telling him that this was, this was probably a bad place to go, but he knew he had to go and help people, and that was James all over. He just didn't think of himself, and I think he, on his past experiences of going to Afghanistan and Bosnia, he knew the dangers. He, he, was, he was no fool in that regard, um, but he just knew he had to help people. James was among seven aid workers killed in an Israeli airstrike while delivering food to besieged Palestinians. Alongside him was James Henderson, who'd served for six years in the Royal Marines and was remembered today in his hometown of Falmouth. If you were one of his people, he would die for you. And he's such a beautiful, beautiful part of all of our lives. And John Chapman, a former Special Forces commando who joined the military from school. In a statement, his family said, we're devastated to have lost John, who was killed in Gaza. He died trying to help people and was subject to an inhumane act. He was an incredible father, husband, son and brother. He was loved by many and will forever be a hero. 
he will be missed dearly. I just hope this is a turning point in, in the world now and, and what's happening in Gaza. I don't want to make a political thing of it, but we just hope that world leaders can get together and, and help these people. Israel says the strike was unintended, but the British government wants to know more. I spoke to Prime Minister Netanyahu last night and was very clear with him that the situation is increasingly intolerable and what we urgently need to see is a thorough, transparent investigation into what has happened. Labour also wants an investigation. The Lib Dems go further. I really think it now is the time to end uh, British exports of arms to Israel. It does look like Israel has broken humanitarian law. One thing that will be impacted is aid. Multiple charities are to suspend food deliveries to the Palestinians. But the security firm where the soldiers worked says it hopes to continue its work. Everything that we did was as much as we could do. Um, our staff continue to be professional and focused on the task in hand and we will continue business as usual. This was an international relief team. Zomi Franken, an Australian. Jacob Flickinger, an American-Canadian. It all adds to the global pressure on Israel to explain why more than 200 aid workers have been killed in this conflict. Jason Farrell, Sky News. Israel has promised to investigate the attack, but here's what we know happened so far. Sky News' data and forensic unit has been taking a look into the details of the attack. The World Central Kitchen teams have been delivering more than 100 tonnes of humanitarian food aid to a warehouse in Deir el-Bala. The convoy then left, driving through the so-called de-conflicted zone. Now, the strike was estimated to have been carried out between 10.30 and 11pm local time on Monday. After the strike began, it's been reported that some of the aid workers moved between vehicles on the Al Rashid coastal road, seeking safety. The cars, two of which were armoured, were found at three different locations along that uh, coastal road, across a total distance of 2.4 kilometres. World Central Kitchen said it had given Israel its coordinates and that they knew the route the cars were travelling. So what's been the diplomatic fallout? Here's our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle. Tonight, aid ships that were en route to Gaza arrived back in Cyprus after being turned around following the attack on Monday night. World Central Kitchen, which has been one of the biggest providers of aid in Gaza during this war, has now suspended operations after some of its staff were killed by Israeli drone strikes. The Israeli military says it is investigating and more aid will be allowed into Gaza from now on. The British Foreign Secretary said today that he will hold the Israeli government to that assurance. We've been promised these things before and this really needs to happen, including longer opening times at the vital crossing points. But of course the extra aid won't work unless there is proper deconfliction, unless aid can be taken around Gaza and we avoid the dreadful incidents like we see, we've seen in the last couple of days. That is vital and Britain will be watching very closely to make sure that that happens. The Israeli government has admitted responsibility but again blamed the chaos of war. The fault was on Israel's side. It was a catastrophic uh, failure. Yes, of course, you know, it's a war. It was dark. Uh, it's a war zone. There is growing pressure for the UK to stop arms sales to Israel in light of the killings. The Foreign Office has so far refused to comment on that. After the initial outrage yesterday, politicians in London, Washington and elsewhere have been more reserved today. The Israeli military has promised to publish the results of its investigation in the coming days. So it could be that Western governments are waiting for that before deciding on their next steps. The seven killed on Monday were not the first aid workers to be killed in this war. Almost 200 have now lost their lives over the past six months of fighting in Gaza. It is one reason why Israel is rapidly losing international support. The IDF and the government here will need to work hard now to win back the trust of their allies. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News in Jerusalem. 
Well, let's stay with the situation in Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu is under renewed pressure. And tonight, a member of his own war cabinet has called for early elections. Take a listen to this from Benny Gantz. I believe that uh, the Israeli society needs to renew its contract with its leadership. And I think the only way to do it and still maintaining the national effort in fighting Hamas and terrorist group and other security challenges is by having an agreed election date that we have to discuss when and if. Uh, and I hope that uh, my political partners and friends and maybe some rivals as well uh, will agree to it because I think it serves all the country and all its sectors. Benny Gantz there. Well, there's not just cause for the UK to cut arms sales, but pressure on the United States too to cut back its support to Israel. But what does the breakdown of Israel's arms imports actually look like? Well, one report shows that 69% of Israel's arms imports come from the US. Germany makes up 30%, Italy just 1%. The UK had no major sales of arms to Israel recently, the government here saying it supplies just 0.02% of Israel's military imports over what they describe as an undisclosed time frame. So could there be any change of policy there on the issue of arms sale? Our US correspondent Mark Stone uh, joins me now. Hi, Mark. Um, do you think this is going to change policy in any meaningful way? I don't think there are any signs of it uh, in the short term, certainly. There was one um, comment that John Kirby, the uh, spokesperson for President Biden for foreign policy issues, that he made yesterday at the podium uh, here at the White House, where he, he effectively said nothing is going to change at the moment. Um, at the moment, was doing s some heavy lifting there, uh, I, I think. But the sense I get, whether you uh, look at President Biden's statement issued overnight, the only thing that we have had from President Biden uh, in response uh, to the killings uh, of those uh, uh, aid workers yesterday. The language was much, much stronger, but then it was countered uh, by podium statements by his spokesperson, Corinne uh, uh, Jean-Pierre, and by John Kirby as well, another spokesperson, uh, where they reiterated what we have heard for many, many months, that Israel has the, the right to defend itself, that it is facing uh, an enemy um, with genocidal intentions in Hamas, in Gaza, an enemy that is still able to attack Israel. And for that reason, uh, America, so says this White White House uh, will continue to provide uh, all that Israel needs. But at the same time, they say that they want investigations. Now, they always say that. They always ask for investigations. I can count. Uh, there are countless times that I can remember over the past six months where I've heard either the State Department or the White House saying, we're worried about what Israel is doing here, there. We're worried about this death or those deaths, whether they be in Gaza or in the West Bank. We've asked for an investigation. And yet, Adam, you never hear what the response of that investigation is. And I think that's something that you can go back through conflicts with involving Israel many decades and you will find the same thing. The results of the investigation are often uh, pretty woolly. Yeah. Mark, as you said, words carrying uh, are doing a lot of heavy lifting. Mark Stone there in America. Well, let's bring in tonight's panel. Journalist Sahar Zand and the foreign policy expert at the Henry Jackson Society, Aliona Good evening to, uh, to both of you, um, Tyler. Let, let's kick up with you. I mean, a very, very busy, tragic, politically charged couple of days. What do you think should happen next? What's happened is absolutely appalling. I think we can all agree. And people who are trying to save other people's lives shouldn't be killed. Um, a lot of people are arguing that what's happened now is one incident too many for it to have been um, another accident, as Netanyahu and Israeli officials have suggested. We know that 196, if I'm not mistaken, um, humanitarian aid workers have been killed in Gaza since the conflict began. And um, the founder of the NGO World Central Kitchen has said on his um, Twitter, um, formerly Twitter X, that Israel should stop using food as a weapon of war. A lot of agencies and NGOs and experts have been sounding the alarm bells for a long time for in the, in the past few weeks, saying that a famine is close and this was a particularly bad time for this attack because now a lot of NGOs, including 
the World Central Kitchen, which has been one of the biggest providers of food in, um, in Gaza, has pulled back their support. So what should happen? That's the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that need to happen. Some of the campaigners say there shouldn't be a war in the first place. Many others say, well, there is a war, but Israel should facilitate for aid workers and especially for food to be able to enter Gaza securely and safely. And a lot of, you know, they've said that they are going to be investigating this and governments, including our government and the US, has asked them to investigate this swiftly and to basically find out why this has happened. Yeah. But some say that that is not enough. Well, Aliana, let, let, let me turn to you. We, we've heard this, the request for mm. investigation, contrition from, from the Israeli government. Alison Bunkle, they're saying, perhaps politicians today are a little more reserved. What's going to happen next, do you think? I think, first of all, we do need to wait for the outcome of investigation. And I know your Washington reporter was saying that those outcomes are not always public. But when you're at war and national security is at stake, not everything can be made public. Uh, I think the incident is completely intolerable because it does put uh, the lives of humanitarian aid workers under risk, and not just them, but also about two million uh, Gazan civilians um, are under risk of famine now. So the most important and horrific repercussion that we might be facing is the halt of that humanitarian aid going into Gaza Strip. But on the other hand, we do have under to understand that this is war. Uh, mistakes happen, and of course, they need to be investigated and see where there was negligence uh, conducted by the IDF, it was good to see that they've admitted to it straight away and that they are looking into seeing what went wrong. So, is there a risk here that this escalates? You know, we, we clearly, we, we saw the Israelis attacking the, the, the Iranian consulate in, in Damascus. How worried should we be that this is the match that lights an even bigger fire? I think the situation particularly in the Middle East, is so turbulent that everything, and there has been so many incidents, with everything that happens, this question rises. And with Iran's proxies supporting and being part of different parts of this war, I think this is something that is worrying a lot of people. And, Aliana, I mentioned there Benny Gatz, that throwing, uh, talking of throwing matches onto fires. Mm. I mean, Netanyahu's just had surgery, he's recovering. If the Israeli political system is unstable, that has big ramifications, right? The Israeli political system has been unstable for a couple of years now. Yeah. Uh, that, unfortunately, is a given, and perhaps it's also driven the response mm. uh, to the Hamas attack on the 7th of October. Um, Netanyahu has almost no point of return, and, of course, he is a legitimately elected leader of Israel, and it's up to people of Israel uh, to decide his fortune and how the state is going to respond. Um, to uh, the Hamas attack and, and how to deal with them going forward. It, one thing is certain that Israelis do feel like this is an existential threat to them, that this is not just another flare-up um, in the 100-year-old conflict, mm. uh, if you will. It is something that they're taking very seriously and willing to go all the way. As is the word. Both. Thanks very much for the moment. Both. Uh, much more from you guys later on in the programme. OK, time for another tribute to one of those aid workers. A little earlier, I spoke to a good friend of uh, Damian Sobol, a Polish man who was killed in Monday's airstrike alongside six others. Mikhail Avrykovsky worked alongside Damian in Ukraine and then again in Turkey following last year's major earthquake. He shared his memories of working with his friend. Damian was uh, the best for, uh, uh, of all us, uh, always uh, willing to help. Uh, forever smiling, uh, like on the on the on the, the this uh, picture, there was uh, no task uh, he won't try. Uh, we meet over two years ago when uh, well, years ago uh, years ago when uh, the war between started the war between Russia, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we uh, like uh, our foundation, free place uh, uh, went to border and uh, to Med uh, Medica. Uh, to help re refugees, and uh, and uh, uh, after a few days we started work, and uh, we meet uh, organization World Center Kitchen, and Damian was in this organization. Damian was in the first moment on the uh, to help to like voluntary, but after a few days he started be uh, leader because uh, American people uh, see in him 
many many talents and to to help people and after time after a short time he started he started be a leader uh work on the borders every borders between ukraine and uh, poland and uh, we work at seven years seven months ago it's uh, seven times seven months uh together and we are very very close he helped me to start uh work in turkey uh he helped me to take uh, products to prepare food because you know in turkey in this moment was nothing uh, is that the sort of person he was he, he wanted to get involved yeah exactly and he, he was perfect to prepare everything to help me to start work and every time when we have uh, any problems we call to to damian we ask about everything and he said don't worry don't worry don't worry my bro my brother my brother i i will come for 10 minutes 15 minutes to you and help you how did you hear about the attack and and about your friend's death uh i pray about his no damian maybe this another man from poland who, who i know i don't know but uh, of course in the first moment i take my phone and and and, and write to to damian how are you, bro? Where, where are you? And everything is okay. But of course, was not, not answer. His phone is uh, uh, nine 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 thirty eight p.m. was finished uh, work. And uh, after a few minutes, uh, was information from my friends from Words and the Kitchen about Laman is uh, dead. Uh, uh, this is uh, accident. It's, it's, it's impossible, but it's true. Uh, and after time, we see the pictures. What well, yeah. the pictures was very, very, Just very bad. Thought, your your very, friend very, has very... died in this 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 horrible way. Let's be honest. How angry yeah, exactly. are you with Israel? No, not angry for Israel because we are angry for every uh, people who uh, are on the war because every war is bad. Uh, people, uh, war in between Russia and Ukraine war in Israel and Palestine and every war on the world is bad because people, uh, normal people, no, no soldiers, but people uh, are hungry. And finally, how will you remember Damien? What is, what is one trait, one character you'll remember about him? Yeah, maybe this, uh, when the, every problem, uh, when we call to Damien, we said, Damien, we have problem. Damien said, this is no problem. Only one problem? You have one problem? This one problem is no problem. Uh, and, and he always come to me or to my people uh, to change uh, the situation. I said, hey, how are you? And everything is okay. Uh, don't worry. And, and go to, to another, another place. And always uh, he, uh, he, he was a believer. Uh, many times we, 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 we write to, 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 uh, between about uh, good things, about God, about the uh, future. Uh, he was very, very friendly. Uh, he li really loved people, and he really loved this work because this work was his life. You are watching The World with me, Adam Parsons. After the break, Taiwan's biggest earthquake in more than a quarter of a century. We'll have the latest after at least nine people die and more than trapped. It's one of the most dramatic sights in nature. A total solar eclipse, when day turns to night in a rare and spectacular sight. Join millions of people across Mexico, the US and Canada and watch the total eclipse live in a special program on Sky News. I mean, a recent study proved that with some beagles, those that had um, training after about the age of six were much more on the ball than those that didn't. I suppose you could say it's a no-brainer. Hey. So, you know, just with us, as with us, Kay, keeping yourself mentally dexterous, doing a crossword puzzle every day. Mr Binks, you're going on a bit of an adventure there. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> Thinks. So keeping your dog um, alert, boy. doing little tricks like maybe going into a down now, maybe turning away, not facing the camera, but we don't mind. Um, looking out for 
feeding your dogs a very healthy diet. So cutting out all the complex carbs, a bit like we're recommended to not eat overly processed foods every single day. Like we're recommended to get out and about, take in the fresh air, take up a new hobby, socialise a lot. And the interesting thing is, by owning a dog, <laughs> thinks by owning a dog, yeah. um, you actually tick so many of those boxes without having to try, Kate, because you're out walking your dog, you're out meeting other dog owners, so you're socialising, you feel like you're in a club. Um, so it's interesting to note that dog owners do tend to not get dementia as much as those people that don't own a dog. And it's all about going to the different places to see the different faces. And, um, and that keeps dogs alert um, and minimises mm -hmm. um, dementia. Mm -hmm. But for me as well, it's the gut-brain axis mm -hmm. that we're being told about very much on a human level. And you know, Kay, that you are what you eat. Yes. So keeping the dog's food healthy, oh, keeping the dog eating foods that dogs are meant to eat, so lots of fresh meat, and antioxidants will also keep him really alert. But you see, he's looking around, he's yeah. well perky. Now, Taiwan is no stranger to earthquakes. It lies on the Pacific Ring of Fire, where most of the world's earthquakes actually occur. Today, though, it suffered its biggest quake for a quarter of a century. Our Southeast Asia correspondent, Cordelia Lynch, now reports. As the ground shakes and debris falls, the news presenter stays incredibly composed. Outside, the moment the capital, Taipei, starts to rumble. It's rush hour, and commuters are suddenly caught up in a terrifying journey. High in the sky, a rooftop swimming pool overflows. The force took many by surprise. The feeling was uh, like being grabbed by someone by the shoulders and shook violently. It was incredibly unsettling, and I felt my eyes pop out of my skull when I, I checked the news and realised this wasn't actually in Taipei where I was, and was in Hualien, which is uh, very far from, from where we are. Others were trapped, more than 70 in this and another nearby tunnel. They had to be rescued. The focus shifting to 70 people stuck in two quarries elsewhere in Hualien County and 50 employees of Silk's Place Hotel Taroko who were stranded on minibuses. It's been described as the strongest earthquake to hit Taiwan in a quarter of a century, leaving this block of flats in the small city of Hualien nearly tipped on its side and tens of thousands of people without power. The most important thing right now is to rescue people. We have to carefully check how many people are still trapped. We must quickly help those who are trapped, and the wounded must be given the best medical care. As the earthquake began to hit in the early morning, its effects were quickly visible, with vehicles rocking from side to side. 
rattling the furniture in people's homes. But there was little sign of panic in a part of the world whose people and buildings are remarkably equipped for tremors. Schools calmly took their students to safety outside, the serenity of some picturesque parts briefly disturbed. Bits of Turtle Island broken. And the earthquake did unleash huge landslides. But tsunami warnings in Japan and the Philippines were lifted. The threat of a far more serious disaster, thankfully, removed. Cordelia Lynch, Sky News. With global tensions simmering, you might imagine that Britain's recent leaders would have obsessed about the defence of the country. And you'd be wrong. Sky News has learned that the government has no national plan for the defence of the UK, despite renewed threats of war. Our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, now reports. When the Cold War ended, Mike Parrish picked up a hot bargain a top-secret nuclear bunker built by the government under his family's farmland. So would we be safe once he got to this part? Well, yes, safer than being outside, obviously, because you've got the blast door to go through to start with. Now a tourist attraction, it's taken on a new relevance amid warnings of future war. The United Kingdom was heavily attacked with nuclear weapons at one o'clock this afternoon. This is where the Prime Minister of the day might have come in the event of a nuclear strike. The underground safe house in Essex was one of a network of bunkers tasked with keeping government services running to help survivors. The scale of this bunker underlines how seriously governments during the Cold War took the threat of nuclear attack and global conflict. Thankfully, these defences were never actually needed, but at least they had a plan that was resourced and regularly rehearsed. In the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Britain's defence secretary has warned we're moving to a pre-war world. Yet sources have told Sky News there's currently no national plan for the defence of the UK if war breaks out. Tucked away in the National Archives are some of this country's old plans. Called the Government War Book, they detailed how the nation would transition from peace to war, but were phased out after the collapse of the Soviet Union. While the UK relies on its nuclear weapons and NATO membership to deter threats, officials are understood to be developing a cross-government national defence plan even drawing on lessons from the war book. And it wouldn't just be for the military. Industry and the public have crucial roles as well. Now a car plant, this site in Birmingham was transformed from farmland into a Spitfire factory before the Second World War as part of a scheme to grow aircraft production. So-called shadow factories also sprang up in the most unlikely of places, including a cow shed in Shropshire. Asked about the allegation that there's no plan for war, a Cabinet Office spokesperson said, The UK has robust plans in place for a range of potential emergencies and scenarios, with plans and supporting arrangements developed, refined and tested over many years. The end of the tunnel, but there are still worries down. about Britain's hollowed-out defences as global threats Terrific. grow. Do you think this bunker might have to come back to life again? It would obviously be something one would contemplate. I don't suppose that the government would now take this back. But until government do that, of course, it's mine. And so I've got the keys and um, I'll be down here. National preparations for war, perhaps no longer a practice of the past. Deborah Haynes, Sky News. Back with our panel now, Sahar Zand and Aliona Shlivko. And um, Aliona, you're a Ukrainian, so when we talk about preparedness for war, it is a subject you're, you're sort of grimly familiar with. But what do you make of the fact that the UK has no coherent plan of what to do if there's a war? 
Well, it's not surprising that after the post-Cold War era, uh, no nation in the world, including uh, Western democracies, are fully prepared for another World War III, if you'd like. Uh, we have entered a relatively safe era of trade uh, and normalization of international relations. Many people talked about the end of history, the mm. Uh, famous Fukuyama theory, which I still think is coming, but it is going to be postponed because history does move in sine waves. Um, so the UK was not fully ready to face um, the security situation we are facing now in the world, but I think it's slowly waking up to the new reality. Sort of understandably complacent, we could call that. Unfortunately. So uh, what, do you, what do you make of it? I mean, do politicians need to jump up and start doing things? I think the memory of COVID and the UK's unpreparedness is still very fresh in the public's minds and the way it was handled. So it's hardly surprising that Brits like myself are feeling, you know, the, the pressure. And um, it's quite shocking when we hear that UK's ministers say that they're not ready mm -hmm. given the state of things, given where Russia is at, given where China, Iran, the state of the Middle East is at. So the prospect of war is very real and very near um, in a way that my generation at least hasn't seen because we have been involved in wars, but they've always been abroad and we've only seen the consequences from afar via terror attacks. You know, not many of us have been directly involved with it, but now it could happen. And remembering how COVID was handled, hearing that the UK says they're not prepared is really, really scary. But it's also important to kind of hear what the UK ministers are saying in the context of what's happening. It is election year. And when Grant Schapp, UK, Schapp's UK's defence minister encourages NATO members to put more money in, it's not unheard of around a time like this um, for politicians to drum up um, votes by trying to raise money for the military. Let's just briefly bring up, we've got a little, a little graphic uh, here about uh, just the nations that have nuclear weapons. Mm. So there's five, five of them who, uh, who actually have these, these nukes. There we go, Russia, US, China, France, the United Kingdom. And there are other nations who, uh, who have them, Pakistan, India, North Korea. We can probably add Israel to that list, but, but it doesn't actually have it. Aliona, nuclear weapons, I mean, have they kept the peace or are they still a, a ter terrible risk to humanity? I think nuclear weapons is the greatest deterrent that Western democracies have today. And it's actually great luck that the UK does have its nuclear submarines. Um, that the United States provides that nuclear umbrella for Europe, including countries like Germany, um, who's given up their weapons after the Second World War and is now rearming. And of course, France is, is quite self-sufficient in that way as well. The biggest mistake we've seen that Ukraine has made, talking about being Ukrainian and being at war for 10 years, is giving up its nuclear weapons in 1994 mm -hmm. under the Budapest Memorandum. And mm -hmm. it wasn't just Ukraine, it was Belarus and Kazakhstan who gave up those weapons too. And now American President Bill Clinton is highly remorseful about that because mm -hmm. that could have been that important deterrent that could have stopped Russian aggression at its core. Uh, for the moment, both. thank you very much. You're watching The World with me, Adam Parsons. And coming up... The main suspect in the Madeleine McCann disappearance appears in court on separate charges. He complains he'll never get a fair trial.
The trial involving the main suspect in the Madeleine McCann case has been held up after the defence accused prosecutors of creating worldwide prejudice against him. Our crime correspondent Martin Brunt is following the trial, sent us this report from Braunschweig in Germany. Christian B arrived from his prison cell ready to meet one of his main accusers. Inside the courtroom, he looked like a man who knew what was coming. The handcuffs were off, but he could hardly relax. I watched a third video and there was another girl on it. Helga Bushing is the former friend who catapulted Christian B to notoriety. The witness told police that Christian B had confessed he was the abductor of missing Madeleine McCann. In 2017, he became the main suspect. He still is. The witness said he tipped off the McCann's investigator, Dave Edgar, 16 years ago. Mr Edgar said he didn't recall that and at the time had been sifting through thousands of leads. But here, Christian B is on trial for other things. He denies three rapes and two sex assaults, all allegedly committed in Portugal. The witness said he'd seen videotapes on which Christian B had filmed himself raping two of the victims. He stole the tapes, he said, from his old friend's rented home in Portugal. One showed a teenage girl tied to a wooden post and abused. On the other, he claimed, he saw an elderly woman raped on a bed. The defence lawyers question whether the videotapes ever existed. Investigators have never found them, and the witness said he sold them. There were tense exchanges throughout the day. The witness wouldn't give the court his home address. He refused to answer certain questions and was threatened with a fine. And when he said he couldn't remember things, the judge told the defence, perhaps it's the way you're asking him. The witness said when he gave Christian B's name to Scotland Yard, he didn't foresee the consequences. Mr Bushing said his involvement with the defendant had cost him his job, his home and his friends. Martin Brunt, Sky News in Braunschweig, Germany. Next, the story of unsuspecting men forced into battle. Sky News has spoken to a number of Indian families who say their relatives were threatened and coerced into joining Russian forces on the front line in Ukraine. Here's our India reporter, Neville Lazarus. <laughs> It's a war they didn't sign up for. Several Indian men allege they have been forced into fighting for the Russian military in the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. These videos shared by the families of those trapped in the battle far away from home. Thousands of miles away in the village of Mathur in Haryana, the only talk here is of the six men caught up in a war zone. Ajay's family sold land to finance his brother Ravi's travels. He was arrested in Moscow for visa violations. He's being duped. He was supposed to be a helper and they forced him into the war in Ukraine. This is cheating. They said either go to jail for 10 years or fight in the war. Sky News was shown multiple Russian Ministry of Defense contracts. It states the men must perform military duty and service to defend the Russian Federation. It carries the sign of a commander and stamp of a military unit. Sky News put these allegations to the Russian embassy in Delhi. There has been no response yet. Aman is fearful for his younger brother's life as he lies injured in a hospital. The army gave him a job of a helper, but he didn't know he'll be sent into war. As soon as he gets better, he'll be sent back to the front line. After that, there's no chance of him coming back. Many who sought better prospects are from small cities and towns, but have ended deceived and coerced on the front lines in a foreign land. There is distress in the rural economy. Unemployment is quite high, forcing young men to seek jobs abroad, putting them in these difficult circumstances. 
हम सब साथ यहाँ पर रशियन आर्मी में पस चुके हैं। We have got stuck in the Russian army. Our friends have been sent to the front line, and we are told we will be next. 19-year-old Harsh appeals to the Indian government to rescue them. Body bags have begun returning home. Two men were killed last month on the front line. The Indian government are yet to confirm the numbers fighting for the Russians, but for those whose loved ones are trapped, the wait is ever so agonizing. Never Lazarus, Sky News in Kerthal, Haryana. This is the world with me, Adam Parsons. Next, AI's threat to music. Artists have signed a letter against the predatory use of AI. And tonight on News at 10, more on the interview with the family of one of the victims of the Israeli airstrike, plus the secret recordings revealing what the post office knew about the Horizon scandal. And could an old face of Formula One be making a comeback? Dowd and I'm Sky's Midlands correspondent. We can reveal that the driver who hit Harry Dunn is 42-year-old Anne Sekoulas. Just met the president and we never thought we'd get this far. This is what they're up against, is back-breaking work. Water levels are dropping, but no one knows what impact further rain will have. What would you do if this place wasn't open? We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's really scary. In this community, I'm told that everybody knows someone affected by COVID. Change seems tantalisingly close in this corner of the UK. This is my patch, my specialism. It's also my home.
More than 200 music artists, including Billie Eilish and Katy Perry, have signed an open letter calling for the use of AI to be reined in for the sake of the industry. Here's RT Natchapan on what's got them so worried. I used to float, now I just fall down. From Billie Eilish I'm a dog, but I still wanna party. to Nicki Minaj to Stevie Wonder. Around 200 artists have signed an open letter warning tech companies against using their songs to train AI models without their consent, saying, This assault on human creativity must be stopped. We must protect against the predatory use of AI to steal professional artists' voices and likenesses, violate creators' rights, and destroy the music ecosystem. And that's a, a potentially huge loss to artists monetarily. The bigger name artists are obviously worried about their um, their work being stolen and their persona and likeness and their voice being stolen. But the um, everyday working musicians who may not be known, um, they're worried about kind of what the future is for human musicians. But for some, there are commercial benefits. An AI hologram will bring the late king of rock and roll back to the stage. Who loves you, girl? And some artists are capitalising on the tech by licensing their voices to AI companies. A lot of musicians in the UK are already using AI in a different way. But I think in the terms of generative AI, whether this mass ingestion of copyright works that already exist, I think that that can't continue uh, to go on without any payment or any kind of recognition of the original uh, artists and creators. AI has the potential to advance human creativity, but in the absence of regulation, it could pose a threat to the work of human creators. Artinat Chippen, Sky News. Well, Sahazand and Aliona Klivko are still here. Aliona, uh, I mean... AI and music. I mean, at the heart of it, there's something quite important there, isn't there? It's very interesting to witness the fourth industrial revolution in action that grasps all of the areas of our life. It's not just generative AI and large language models. It's not just progression of AI in defense, but also in day-to-day -day life like music. And yes, it does need to be regulated. And we are now in the process of creating a new framework of our future existence. That is profound. So uh, uh, what, what do you... What do you make of this? I mean, music for so many people is such profound importance. Yes, and it's not just music that is being deeply impacted by AI, and it's not just musicians who are worried that AI is going to take over their jobs, their livelihoods, engineers, journalists, doctors. So many people are scared, and the, thoughts, the thought is that AI can actually do it better because it has all the information and it can produce so much more and it can also create work in real time, custom made to the receiver without the human error. But the fact of the matter is that people are going to be impacted, creatives are going to be impacted, doctors, engineers, journalists, and there needs to be regulations to protect them. The idea that you can replace journalists with AI is, is too fierce. That's too. the one thing that they can't do. So, uh, Ali, I'd like to see you. them try and come sit down here. I, I don't want to see them try. <laughs> uh, thank you both very much for your Scary company. Uh, that is uh, all for uh, tonight. News at 10 with uh, more on the growing pressure on the United Kingdom to suspend its arms sales to Israel. Thank you both. Thank you.